The Town of Plainville. Established in 1721 at the Geographical Center of Connecticut. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Robert Lee. I'm the Town Manager for the Town of Plainville and I want to welcome everyone to this public information session with regards to our wastewater treatment plant phosphorus upgrade project. Um, I'd like to uh, point out that there are two council people here this evening. Um, Rosemary Morante and Jesse Nazo, uh, and uh, uh, the purpose of this meeting is to explain uh, the reason for the phosphorus upgrade, uh, what improvements uh, are needed, and what the potential cost and impact is to, uh, to Plainville. Uh, so with that in mind, I would like to uh, turn uh, uh, the microphone over to Steve Siegel, who works for Tyan Bond. He's the consultant. He's uh, the lead uh, person on our consulting team, and he will uh, uh, run through the uh, PowerPoint slide program that we have for this evening. So, Steve, if you would want to step forward. Thank you, Robert. You're welcome. Good evening, everybody. Uh, as Robert said, uh, what I'd like to do is uh, introduce you or, or re reintroduce you to of this uh, wastewater project and the goals and objectives of the project. Um, there, there are I'm going to talk about three major goals that have driven that are driving the project to completion. One is, and perhaps the most important one, is the town has received a uh, discharge permit from the Connecticut Deep Department of Energy Environmental Engineering that requires the town to lower the amount of phosphorus being discharged from its wastewater treatment plant. And this graph, uh, and I'll talk about this a bit more in detail later in the presentation, but this graph just demonstrates that historically the town has discharged 29 pounds of phosphorus per day on average. The new permit that was received uh, July of 2015 requires the town to reduce that amount of phosphorus down to 3.49 pounds per day, which represents an 88% reduction. And the permit further requires that this reduced level of phosphorus uh, come into effect by uh, July 10th of 2019. So that's really the major goal uh, driving the project. But there are several other goals. One is resiliency, as we all know and we've seen in Connecticut and for that matter throughout the Northeast that the effect of climate change and rising water levels has caused uh, storm damage and, and that seems to be a significant and increasing and growing issue. So one of the requirements that the Connecticut Deep has is that for new facilities, that the facilities be designed not just at the 100-year flood elevation, but three feet above that 100-year flood so that in the event of uh, large storms, um, they can be brought back onto, into service very quickly. And the third goal for this project is to improve the sludge processing system. Uh, some may recall that the, the Plainville plant was upgraded uh, in the late uh, 2000s, uh, 2009, it completed um, a construction project to upgrade it for nitrogen removal. And at that time, uh, the sludge processing system was not upgraded because it was relatively new. It was, it was only about a dozen years old, so it didn't make sense to replace it at that time. But, but there are reasons to replace it now, and I'll explain that in, in just a few minutes. So let me answer a question that some might have which is why are we removing phosphorus? Why does the state require communities to reduce phosphorus? And I, I might add, it's not just Plainville that's affected. Um, there are 45 communities in Connecticut that are under a phosphorus removal program goal, and 11 communities have goals, stringent goals similar to Plainville. But the reason why phosphorus has become the issue of concern that it has is because phosphorus has been shown to be a nutrient that has caused eutrophication and the growth of algae. And that has been um, uh, problematic both for recreational uses of, of water bodies, uh, but also for uh, it's changed the uh, environment in the, in the water course, diatoms and other kinds of indicators and 
um, species uh, uh, don't do well when there's low oxygen. And that's really what phosphorus has caused. And phosphorus is particularly of concern for low flow rivers or rivers with impoundments. So if Plainville, if, if the Connecticut River were flowing past Plainville, uh, it, phosphorus would not be a concern. But because you discharge to the Pequabic and it's a slow moving river, um, it, it's the impact of phosphorus is pronounced. <clears throat> uh, let me just go back to the, the, the thought then about Connecticut Deep and the permit that has been issued to Plainville. Some ask, well, what happens if we don't do anything? What, you know, what authority does Connecticut Deep have to impose these limits? And in fact, uh, Connecticut Deep writes the permits uh, that are uh, essentially co-written with US EPA. And the permits are legally binding documents. And, and if, if not complied with, uh, towns can be um, fined and judicial action can take place. And this has happened in the past, uh, not in Plainville, but in, in other communities in, in Connecticut and in New England. Uh, so uh, Connecticut Deep's authority to write permits is, is in uh, state and federal law. But um, Connecticut Deep also has some um, programs to help communities um, be of the cost of the capital cost of some of these projects. And one, the, the major funding mechanism the Connecticut Deep Office or the state office is the so-called Clean Water Fund, or the state revolving loan fund program. And uh, this program has been in effect for, 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 well, for at least 30 plus years now. Um, it offers grants uh, and low interest loans at 2%. Um, but in the last several years, uh, because of this phosphorus issue being uh, an issue that has affected a, a number of communities, the Connecticut uh, legislature uh, has uh, passed a, a prepared a bill that the governor signed that is offering a 50 percent grant for phosphorus removal projects that have a, a very low limit, as Plainville does, and 20 percent grant for the remainder of the project. So between all the components in this project, the net grant for, for Plainville would be a 41 percent grant with a 2 percent loan. So you might say, in some sense, Connecticut Deep has both the, the carrot and the stick. And in this case, the carrot is a, a, a fairly generous grant opportunity. <clears throat> so once it was determined that Plainville did need to upgrade its facility to remove phosphorus, the next question was, well, how best to do that? And there are several technologies available out there that can remove phosphorus to these low limits. And um, the way it was determined was a bench scale testing was, was performed on, on the samples from the town's wastewater. Uh, after a detailed and thorough analysis, a particular technology called disk filtration was selected in which phosphorus is, is uh, fil essentially filtered out of the final effluent through these disk filters. And the way it works is the, the, your current plant uses um, sequencing batch reactors to remove pollutants. That's the, this is the, pro the, the process that was built in, in the late 2000s, 2008, 2009, in which wastewater enters these tanks and through a series of actions within the tanks, adding air and bacteria naturally occurring in the wastewater, degrade the wastewater to a point where it's, it's relatively clean. It then gets disinfected and discharged to the aquatic. So this is the plant as it exists today. Um, one of the aspects of the plant I mentioned was the need to, uh, was the need to uh, deal with resiliency. So the, ex the existing disinfection system is, is planned to be relocated because it was flooded last, during the last flood. And a, a quick demonstration of this video from Hurricane Irene shows essentially water, the river backing up and inundating the plant. So this project includes relocating this existing UV system 
to a higher elevation. And that's going to be accomplished by relocate, oops, sorry, by, by relocating that UV system in this new building that will be constructed. So the plan, the major element of this project includes building a new building that will house the, you, the, out, the disinfection system at a higher elevation, plus the disk filters will be located in this new building as well. <clears throat> um, and another element of the project, as I mentioned earlier, was to, is to replace the sludge processing system. Um, the system is now uh, in, in unable to handle the amount of sludge that is, is predicted to be generated once the new facility comes online. It just doesn't have the capacity, and it's, uh, be, and it's now reached the, uh, close to the end of its useful service life. But one problem in particular has been a very high level of maintenance is required because the sludge has continues to plug the discharge pipe along the way, so it causes the operators to have to clean the pipes on a regular basis. And you can kind of see that the existing system, the, the existing unit is located in this building, and there's a series of pipes with bends and fittings, and this piping gets plugged fairly frequently, and that requires a lot of um, downtime and maintenance attention. So the plan is to move, is to relocate new equipment in what was the formal lime silo room. So just going back for a second, there's a, there's a uh, space in this building that we're looking at using. It's currently unused. It's a formal lime silo room, and we'll install a new sludge thickening equipment right in that room, which is adjacent to the tank in which it discharges to, and it will have the capacity to handle the projected phosphorus sludge, but also it will be state-of-the-art in terms of energy efficiency, serviceability, and less maintenance. Which brings us to, well, what's all this going to cost? And uh, we've, we've broken this down into a slide that presents the costs with construction, engineering services, some additional services for programming the computer system and permitting, uh, temporary borrowing costs because the town will have to finance this project while it's being constructed, the, the state will lend them the town to money at 2 percent, but that will be short-term borrowing and then it will be rolled into a permanent loan. Uh, th this slide also shows the estimated 41 percent grant money. Uh, so the, the total project is, in, in absolute terms, is about $15.7, $15.8 million, but the, the net cost will be about $9.3 million. Um, so then an analysis was done to see how could, how will this be paid for? And one of the issues, well, a couple of issues, one, one was to have rates in place that help support the, the capital cost of the project. But the second aspect is to have rates in place that provide a fund balance so that um, if there is a unusual capital event in the course of a year or an unusual operating event that the town has um, a, a, a essentially a balance of money in a fund that can be used for those purposes. And, and the normal rule of thumb is to have two to three months of, res of fund balance available to, to account for any unexpected uh, events. So this table, as presented, shows uh, estimated revenues, as you can see, estimated revenues in the top line, estimated expenses, the fund balance, basically the difference between the two, uh, typical user charges, at, at, uh, min typical minimum user charges uh, all the way through 2025, and uh, what the projected uh, user rate increases are over that period. And as you can see, uh, based on this analysis, uh, 2018, 19, and 20 would user rates would increase by four, I'm um, sorry, in 2021, would increase by 4.8%. Uh, in 2022, it would drop to 4%, 4% uh, for the next year, and then drop to 3.25% and, and, and down to 2.5% uh, at, at 2025. So there is um, a decreasing rate increase in the latter years. And this funding scenario funds the entire project and it maintains that two months of funding balance, of, of fund balance. Uh, la my last slide is just to talk about the project schedule. And uh, of course, tonight is uh, the public information meeting. 
uh, is, as I understand, a, a town referendum is, is thought to be uh, uh, January 30th of 2018. Uh, if that is the case uh, and, and the referendum is successful, the project will immediately advertise for general contractors to bid the project. Uh, and the project would actually start construction around May, the, the, the spring, and uh, continue through 2020. One thing of, of note is that I mentioned the, the legislature and the governor signs special legislation allowing these 11 communities who have this very low target limit to access 50 percent grant funding for that phosphorus removal component, but they also put a, a, a limitation that in order to access that 50 percent grant money, a contract with a general contractor or any contract for that matter eligible for this 50 percent has to be signed on or before July 1st of 2019. And that's what this last slide shows is that um, we'll, in this scenario we'll be started with construction well before the deadline uh, passes to access this money. Uh, with that presentation, if there's anyone who has any questions or comments, uh, this would be your time to uh, to, to uh, express that. So, is there anybody who would like to have any questions? She, she just wants a copy of the uh, presentation. Anybody has any questions or comments they'd like to make? I'm sure John would let you go first. He's a very nice guy, and uh, he he's got a lot of questions. So he, maybe you do too. I don't know. Go ahead. I have one question. Your name, sir? Uh, Mark. Okay. Mark. Okay, Mark. Um, so in the pamphlet that they got, that we uh, all received, it says basically if the referendum fails, um, the town will be subject to court enforcement actions and costly fines, which sounds pretty scary. Um, are there any, do you have any hard numbers as to what those fines would be and are there, is it uh, over time or continual? <laughs> Well, you know, with 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 EPA, they they give they give you a high range, and then and then there's what's what's realistic. But Steve will tell you what it could be. Okay. Well, sure. from a statutory standpoint, EPA has the authority to to fine up to thirty seven thousand five hundred dollars per day. Okay. Now, for for every day a violation occurs, right. okay. uh, practically speaking, Connecticut Deep would be unlikely, highly unlikely to to pursue an avenue like that. So you have the statutory authority on one side. Honestly, Connecticut Deep, they don't want to do fines. They want to work with communities to, to get things done. And I think that's fairly well evidenced by the offering the kind of money that they do. But they, ha they, they Connecticut, Connecticut Deep does have the authority to, to fine communities. And um, some communities have been fined. And that's a per day fine, which, you know, even right. if it was $1,000 a day, adds up fairly quickly. Up quite quickly, yes. Yeah, and, and the other aspect of that, of course, is that uh, if we delay going forward with the project, we would lose the opportunity to get the 50% funding for the, uh, for the phosphorus portion of it, which we've calculated is about $2 million. Okay. So, you know, so we, we would lose $2 million right away if we didn't meet the deadline, you know, plus be subject to fines. Okay. Anything else? Uh, no, that's it. All right. Anyway. All right. John, I guess you're up. My name is John Kissel. Yes, John. First question I have, you know, you said the project that we completed before was in 2009. Yes. I was under impression when we did that, we, <coughs> we were told that the system would be good for 20 years. Yes. Now we're being told we need upgrades in a sludge. Why? Well, in the phosphorus. We have to reduce phosphorus, which, uh, which, uh, Yes, and, and we have to upgrade the sludge handling equipment, yes. Yeah, but why, how come the sludge isn't, you know, like we said, 20 years for the plant to last? Phosphorus, taking phosphorus out, that doesn't increase the sludge. It does, absolutely, absolutely increases the sludge. Okay. Absolutely increases the sludge, significantly. That I didn't, that I didn't know. Well, that's, that's, that's why we have the public information meeting. Well, that's why, you know, when a plant's supposed to last 20 years, sure. or, or we planned it to handle it for 20 years. And that was our plan. And, we, and, and you know, the sludge handling equipment probably would have been over its, uh, you know, its normal timeline of all things being equal. But, you know, some, we, it's a 20-year limit. Sometimes they last 25, 30 years. But in this particular instance, the, the phosphorus removal increases the amount of sludge that needs to be, that will be produced. 
And in the, in the brochure here, it says something about um, sludge, 260, I don't know what, the sludge piping, is that 260 feet of yes. sludge piping yes. is going to be repiped? It won't have to be repiped. Go ahead, come on, why don't you come up here. Thank you. The, the, the current problem that the plant experiences, aside from the fact that the equipment is aging and can't handle the capacity, is that it has to pump the, the sludge 260 feet through a number of bends and fittings and such, and the sludge gets hung up in those locations. So the new plan is to put a new piece of equipment in, an, in another location adjacent to where the p sludge gets discharged 30 or 40 feet. So that problem will go You're away. You're actually eliminating pipe. Eliminating pipe, yeah. Okay. Well, I worked on a lot of wastewater treatment plants. I'm a retired plumber pipe fitter. Oh. I worked in Winstead. I, uh, I went out to Grass Island. I was all over. And uh, I never heard of a problem with, with that, but it must have been something in, in design or whatever. Okay, so I'll let that one go. The other, the other thing I have, when was the last sample taken to test the water for phosphorus? It's, it's taken every month. Okay, yep. and it's still up there. Yes. Okay, does General Electric still discharge the waste groundwater into our system? Somewhat, yes. Okay, because the reason I'm asking, if I remember correctly, General Electric, when we had the uh, printout of what was being discharged, there was a lot of uh, petroleum base, and I believe phosphorus was a heavy one too. Mm. So I don't think so. The, no, I don't think phosphorus. I'm, I don't think phosphorus I'm was an issue. On between Milford Street and Milford Street Extension, where GE had to do all that work on their old filtering beds. If you go to the river there at that bridge, that river, when I used to hang around there in the 1950s and 60s, was clean. There was all kinds of fish. If you go there now, it is like a slippery, slippery sludgy mess. Mm -hmm. And that's where they're disturbing that. So I'm wondering if, you know what I'm saying, it's not discharging much phosphorus, it's just me thinking. How's phosphorus getting in our system? Because the manufacturers of laundry detergent, a lot of them are going with no phosphorus anymore. Mm -hmm. So how is mm -hmm. this phosphorus getting into our system? We don't have a thing with farms, you know, with fertilizer. The farm we have is way down the other end of town, and that would discharge into the Quinnipiac. Sure. So, I'll let Steve answer that, but I think we've always had phosphorus in the system. It's just now that now they've found out that phosphorus causes some issues downstream, especially in Long Island Sound, and that's become a higher priority. But I'll let Steve uh, answer how does phosphorus gets in. Phosphorus, we produce phosphorus. Well, let me say this first. <laughs> that's the answer. I know that phosphorus. As people, we produce phosphorus. Yeah. Phosphorus <laughs> is important to life. It's important to our bodies to live, and it's important to all, all plant life. And I understand too much is what's causing this, but maybe you can explain. Uh, uh, it's an excellent question. Um, phosphorus is, it, it comes from many sources, um, point sources, non-point sources from, from fertilizing your yard and runoff. You know, phosphorus comes from many sources, but the major source that phosphorus comes from is us, and we excrete. Uh, when we go to the bathroom, we, we excrete phosphorus in our waste, and that's the, you know, there's, a, there's different types of phosphorus, but it's, total phosphorus is, is uh, the major element from us, basically. So we, we can't get rid of that, but you're absolutely right. Phosphorus um, is an essential nutrient, and, um, you know, as you saw in the pictures before, too much of a good thing causes algae, and then the algae die, and, and, when they die, they decompose and oxygen gets sucked up, and that's what kills fish and you know other marine organisms. That's that's really the crux of the problem. But there's no way to there's no way to get even if GE or laundry detergents didn't exist, we we we're, we're the major source of phosphorus. But you still think we'd be above the state limits? Oh yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. You have a very stringent limit of 0.1 point point one to point two parts, but 88 percent reduction is what is what is required, and an 88 percent reduction is uh, impossible to meet without the kinds of technologies that are the advanced technologies to remove it. Anything else? No. You reserve the right to ask, ask a question if something else pops up. Okay, thank you. I get a second chance? <laughs> yes. Yes, in this public information session, you get more than three minutes and we get more than one chance. All right.
Ma'am, do you have a question? No? Ashley, you have a question? No, I'm good. <laughs> All right. Um, going once. Mrs. Marilyn was just asking about, you know, you're, you're going to raise the uh, building for the UV for, you know, killing the To get it out of the uh, flood what zone. About, what about the rest of the plant? Remember when the it motors got flooded over yeah. and everything? There's, there's nothing else on that. Huh? Well, we, because we're not touching those areas. We're not required to raise them up We don't to make them resilient. So. I think that was more than a hundred year flood, but yes, yes. All that will cause, yes. If it floods more, we're, we're going to have a problem. I think that's really the only time the plant has ever flooded out was it was during that storm. One of the other reasons, or one of, if I may, one, sure. one of the aspect, one of the other aspects of raising the UV system is if there is a flood, God forbid, being able to put it back on, putting the disinfection system back online in, as quickly as possible is a key environmental objective. So yes. It's possible that if we had another Hurricane Irene, you know, there could be similar issues. But by raising at least this important disinfection process, when the flood subsides, the town would be in a position to start disinfecting without waiting for spare parts or damage that might have happened to that system as well. And I have one more, since Robert was so kind to me. We're going to get this increased sludge now, and that's going to have phosphorus in it. Do we have a special way now that we have to get rid of the sludge with the new amounts of phosphorus in it is it going to cost us more for that or where does it get trucked to or we bring we currently bring our sludge to Mattabasset and we will continue to do that we'll still be able to go uh, although it will cost us more on the operation site because there will be more trips to Mattabasset but the new sludge handling system will make the sludge thicker so in theory less water less water not you know but still it's going to be Increased traffic, you know, increased increased trucking, but uh, but it'll be a little thicker. Okay. But yeah, that's one of the issues we got to deal with too: is increased operating costs on certain, you know, in certain areas. All right. Now, where we're going from here is the is the, uh, you know, the the plan is to have this uh, voted on at referendum uh, Ju January thirtieth, uh, but before that. Um, there will be a public hearing, uh, or at least the council is going to be asked to set a public hearing at their next meeting uh, for uh, December 4th, where people can, uh, uh, you know, this was a public information session to just kind of get publicized more the, uh, the need for the project and to answer questions that people may have about it. Uh, but technically, uh, from, from a process point of view, the councils, before they go to referendum, is required to have a public hearing. That public hearing we're requesting would be scheduled for December 4th before a council meeting. The council is, if, if all goes well, the council is expected on December 18th to uh, set the referendum date. That's the plan right now. So um, uh, there will certainly be another opportunity for the public to um, weigh in on the project. And uh, our plan is to take this, the reason why we taped it today was we we're going to provide a link uh, to Nutmeg Network when they when they get it uh, produced, and so that people can uh, view it at their uh, you know from their homes and you know and we'll have a link from the town's website as well. So, I want to thank uh, the few people who came in tonight. I wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> if you I have it, two questions. Okay. Well. well okay. If, if you don't mind. Don't mind. Okay. Thank you. Um, are these numbers fairly firm? You're talking about the con the, the estimates? The estimated project, yeah. Are, huh? they, are, are we in a pretty strong... So do we feel confident with the numbers yeah. that is proposed? Yeah. Well, Steve, put him, Steve helped put them together, so I'll let him answer that question. <laughs> I hope so. I hope his answer is yes, but let's see what he says. <laughs> we, we feel that numbers are great. Of course, we'll know on bid day for sure. And bid days are, you know... Y y in truth, it's a function of how many people bid the job and, uh, you know, how busy folks are. But uh, we're as comfortable as we can be at this point. That's a good number. Okay. And the other part of it is, is there any federal assistance available? Well, the, the, the federal assistance comes through the state. So the federal government gives it to the okay. state and the state gives it to us. Um, at one time, they, you know, they were only proposing that we'd get 30, you know, a 30 percent grant, uh, even for the phosphorus upgrade. and and. Uh, the legislature uh, allowed for that to go to 50 percent, 
uh, if done by a certain time, if, if started by a certain time. And, um, and DEP was not really happy about that because that was going to divert some monies that they wanted to put in other, you know, wastewater, you know, projects. But uh, the decision was made that, uh, that they were going to divert some of it to the, to the phosphorus removal. So uh, that benefits Plainville, like I said earlier, from about, by about $2 million overall on the project. Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. I didn't know you had a question, but, uh, you know, we're not real busy tonight. So, <laughs> so again, thank you, everyone, for coming. And, um, you know, we welcome questions and comments at any time on the project uh, through my office, through the town manager's office at the Municipal Center. So have a good night, and th thanks again for coming.